everyone, and welcome back to Anything Joe's, a collaborative journey through the world of G.I. Joe. My name is Greg Engel. And I'm Jaron Decker. And we'll be your host today. Today on Anything Joe's, uh, there's not a lot of news going on, and that actually works out just fine for us because we're introducing a new a recurring segment to the show, a segment that we like to call Army Surplus, which is where we talk about G.I. Joe things that aren't officially G.I. Joe branded. Basically anything that is not made by Hasbro, that we think is compatible with any scale of the G.I. Joe line uh, will we'll kind of fit in here. That includes, you know, other figure lines, other dioramas, Kickstarters, etc. And uh, since this is the first time we're kicking it off, we thought we would, you know, dedicate a little bit of time to the initial segment. And we've both chosen something unique to talk about for this segment. And I'll go first, since I've already got all my images pulled up. I want to talk about the Eagle Force line. So, if you're not familiar with the Eagle Force line, they're uh, published by Fresh Monkey Fiction, which you might be familiar with as the guys that made the official Larry Hama figure last year, um, to uh, what I think is a pretty well, you know, was received very well overall, or at least I thought it was a great figure. I was able to meet Larry and get him to sign it in the wrong spot. <laughs> but as a, I, bought, I, I ended up buying two. I bought the initial Kickstarter, uh, and then I bought a second one to keep on card. I liked it so much. And it is a great figure. I dabbled a little bit in the Eagle Force line, uh, probably starting with the third wave. With their initial offerings, you know, they put out a lot of figures that were kind of decked out in gold. Very, very reminiscent of the movie Megaforce. Have you ever seen the movie Megaforce? No, but it sounds familiar. It's like a kind of a cheesy 80s, uh, you know, super team, not unlike G.I. Joe, fight and crime. Um, I think they did a Mystery Science Theater 3000 or maybe a Rift Tracks on it. It's uh, it's pretty campy, but it has its own charm. Anyway, some of the figures from this line initially were, were very reminiscent of that. If you know anything about how I collect figures, it, I really don't buy anything that I can't work into the G.I. Joe line in some way. So I haven't been buying Eagle Force figures just like whole hog. I didn't go all in, but more and more as more waves started coming out and have been unveiled, it seems like they are showcasing more figures that are very prominent rep representations of other figures. What I, mean, what I mean by that is some of the figures that I've recently acquired are Wave 5 figures. Out of the Wave 5 figures, there's a figure called Agent Grimm, which is a spot on Keanu Reeves, uh, John Wick, if you will. And there was a Matt Matheson, which is a very cool looking $6 million man homage. And I picked up a, um, I think this is Major Draconis, who doesn't quite fit the bill, but definitely has the head mold of a, oh, I can't remember the guy's name, but the main villain from Mask, Miles Mayhem. So the thing that appeals to me most about that, or this line in general, is that they are filling a lot of voids in a, that are compatible with the four inch modern line. The $6 million man figure, I think, is great. I should be up front and say that the Eagle Forest guys post on their, social media a lot that they do not like for people to discuss the actual person that these likenesses are based on. And I assume that's based on legal reasoning that they don't want to draw attention to the fact that, Hey, here's a figure that looks exactly like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but they don't send me free stuff. So I don't feel, I don't feel obligated to comply with that. And I think it's worth talking about that. You know, this is the primary reason I buy them is because of, you know, how many great figures they are. As a matter of fact, you know, I'll show some pictures of these on the YouTube, but um, looking at the newer waves, the stuff that I actually just got in last week. If I may, is this the line that also has like the Mario and Luigi characters that are coming? Yeah. So or, outside okay. of the, outside of the G.I. Joe scale stuff, I mean, obviously, you know, Keanu Reeves isn't, you know, there's no exact John Wick fit and the Sergeant yep. Blackstone that I just figured just picked up is a, is an Arnold Schwarzenegger figure. It's got the cigar and everything is a great likeness of him. Like I can understand why they want to skirt the legality of it as much as possible. But, and you know, short of somebody sitting down and actually doing a custom, this is the closest thing I've ever seen to a figure that fits in with that scale. And it fits in extremely well. He's part of wave six and I ordered, well, I ordered two figures from wave six. Initially I ordered Sergeant Blackstone and I also ordered a figure called High Tide, which is a drop dead top side from G.I. Joe recreation. Has the blue shirt, has the orange vest, has the navy hat, has the yellow beard. 
One of the things I like about these figures is that if you saw this and went, well, maybe I don't need a top side or I have the FSS top side, which I feel like this figure is infinitely superior to, they all almost all have interchangeable heads, hats, etc. So you could pick up a small, you know, a small quantity of these and they would be per they would fit in perfectly on a flag or a whale, you know, some kind of vessel that needs lots of sailors to deck it out. So I picked that up and I'm extremely happy with that also. Uh, I ended up going back and reordering this entire wave because there's a figure called Low Tide that's exclusive to it. You have to buy the whole wave to get it. And he's a dead on tracker, a figure that we did not get a modern version of. And that scratches an itch that is very regular for me where I'm, I really want to get a modern version of every G.I. Joe figure I can. And because the modern line is DOA, this is the you know, the route that I've chosen to pursue. And they fit in great. They're a perfect scale. The figures themselves are excellent. I want to specifically call out the fact that these are the only toys that I've bought in, I don't know, five plus years that require no manipulation outside of the packaging. They don't have, you don't have to dunk them in hot water. You don't have to like heat them up with a hairdryer. They bend the way they're supposed to be. They, their hands are interchangeable. Just as a ballpark low tide, who doesn't come with an alternate head, but does have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 hands. That's eight different sets of interchangeable hands doing everything from making a strangling motion to a karate chop. He's got glove. There's versions with and without gloves. They're very customizable for, you know, just about whatever you would want to do with them. And my purpose is very minimal. I want him to be tracker. So I'm just going to make him look as, like, as much like that as possible. All of their packaging is, I don't know what they call this, where it's, they're not really sealed. You can open them, take stuff out, put stuff back, and they, and they just kind of fold back over the card. So they're easy to play with. They're easy to put back in display. You don't feel like you, I don't have to buy two of them. You know, one, to, not that I think I would in this case anyway, but they're really accessible to collectors. The independent figures that don't resemble any specific character that's just like into the Eagle Force part are all great. Good enough that I have bought some figures that don't specifically fit in with the G.I. Joe line that I was just like, I could make this a G.I. Joe hero or villain of my choice. And because they look so good and so and are so much fun to play with, you know, it lends itself to that. There's a lot of like space guys that they've been coming out with where the helmets are removable. Yeah, I have a lot, nothing but good, good things to say. Like Jaron was saying, you know, there's a Mario and Luigi figure that's actually very funny. They kind of look like the Mario and Luigi of the uh, live action Super Mario movie. Uh, yeah. I ordered I ordered those for for my daughter because she loves Mario, and I thought, hey, this is you know this is as good as any other figure. And then when she gets tired of it, I'll you know I'll move it in my line. There's a Jack Burton from Big Trouble in Little China that's coming out later this year. They uh, made a figure called Takedown that is basically a stand-in for um, Shockwave. Don't forget the uh, Charlie Brown. Yeah, there's a Charlie Brown that is as competitive as the Marauder's Task Force build, probably better. They have some stuff coming out. They've got a set of three coming out. I think they come out like maybe October of this year. They're still a ways out, but they're, they are basically red shadows. There's like a, the Kraken. I can't remember if that's what he's actually called. I'm not a very strong red shadows guy, even though I have pretty big interest in them. They made two figures that are, that have alternate heads. And if you exchange the heads with the other body, they are, uh, it's like a Baron Ironblood and the, uh, the other main villain from red shadows, which I'm really excited about. There's an awesome guy that's like in a, a military dress and he has two interchangeable heads. One is all bandages and one looks, is like a fake mask with blonde hair. So you've got a unmasked snake eyes or an unmasked snake eyes in disguise. I mean, I could go on and on, if you haven't looked at these at all before, I, you got to go on Big Bad Toy Store and check them out. If I'm not mistaken, these are sold exclusively through BBTS. It's like a partnership with the production. I know they sell some through the website, but I think primarily people will be picking them up from BBTS. They have pre-order waves where they're like, hey, we need this many pre-orders for the figure to go into production. This is our bare minimum. And you can track that aggressively to, like, to see how close it's coming to be in an actualization. We've got a lot of transparency in terms of their production and you know what's actually released. So... Again, highest recommendation. The best modern figures I've played with in a long time. 
And every time I get them in, it's the, these are figures that I don't hesitate to open. You know, I find the weapons I like with them. I play around with them a lot. This Sergeant Blackstone, the Arnold Schwarzenegger figure, I mean, just is great. Just looks great. It's fun to play with and pose. Just looks awesome. Quality control on these is just so good. No paint issues. No, like, nothing's bent. Nothing's out of shape. I, I give it my highest possible recommendation. Of all the stuff I have been buying that's not an official G.I. Joe product, this is my favorite, hands down. And I'm actually a little embarrassed it's taken me this long to talk about it at great length because I think if the awareness around this is not there, then it should be. So yeah, check out the Eagle Force line on BBTS, and if you decide to pick some up, if you have been buying them, drop us a line and let us know what you think about them, because I really think that there's, I think this line has a lot of potential, and will, if they keep going this way, will fill in a lot of gaps in the line without the need to go into a heavy customization process, which is always a little... I mean, I love customization as much as the next person, and I truly am trying to complete many popular, I'm going to use air quotes on that, popular modern figures or popular vintage figures that didn't get the modern figure. And this line has exceeded that. Very rarely do you see a figure that's so qualified to fit the bill that uh, doesn't uh, require any modifications at all. So again, Eagle Force, check them out. Great stuff. Yeah, um, you let me check those out one time when I was over at your place, and they were very impressive. And if I wasn't on the the cutback train, it would be very tempting. Yeah, if these were more readily accessible, like if I ran into them uh, at retail or even at regular conventions, I would probably pick them up. I pursued looking at some of the older figures that were released. They had some like Kickstarter exclusives. But it seems like now that the line has gotten a little bit more popular, that some of that stuff is going to be reissued in slight recolors. Because I do find myself, like I bought this whole wave to get that tracker figure, and I but I do not... I have no regrets. The figures that are I'm getting that I didn't pick up, I'm like, yes, I'll find something for these guys, no problem. The figures that I bought that I'm going to end up with a duplicate of, like the Keanu Reeves and the Sergeant Blackstone, no problem, man. I'll use the alternate heads. I'll make them like I was just talking about. I'm going to get an extra high tide. No sweat, man. This guy's going on the flag, and we're going to be good to go. So I don't even feel like that's money wasted there either. There's going to be something for all of them. I suspect going forward as this line progresses, I will end up kind of going all in on it. They don't release waves. I mean, it's not like Brian G.I. Joe stuff that seems to be coming out almost, you know, every other month you got stuff coming out, if not more aggressively. So, you know, I might pick up, a, you might pick up two waves a year total. So it's not like you're uh, breaking the bank over it. And they've done, they, you know, they did that right commando, which was an actual vintage O-ring figure. So yeah, again, great figure. Check it out. Uh, I love them to death. Jaron, what have you chosen to talk about for Army Surplus? So you talked about not having to heat things up, not having to give it a bath. And I was like, well, if we're talking about the easy things, let's talk about something that's a little more difficult. So I'm going to be talking today about my experience with Valiverse. I want to preface this by saying um, I actually do enjoy these. I'm not in the group that is... A staunch, these are better than Hasbro figures, um, but I'm also not in the, these are absolute garbage figures most of the time. Every once in a while when they get tight, I'm like, oh, they're trash, I'm going to throw them away. Um, but with that being said, they fit in really well with Joe's scale, weapons, everything. You can steal the hands, give them to regular Joe's and kind of interchange. My first experience was I bought the Condor, which is a Wave 1 figure. So that was when they were having more of the issues with the heating and the washing and all that stuff. Um, but I just thought the idea of a British guy that would be working with the Joes was pretty cool. So I was like, oh, I'm going to buy this guy. And then I accidentally bought accidentally bought the, the Duster figure, and I had to do a head swap on that guy immediately. How did you accidentally buy it? <laughs> I was wondering if you're going to let that slide or not. Uh, so <laughs> I'm really bad about leaving things in my BBTS cart. And, uh, so I had that figure in my cart one day and I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. So then I just like kept looking around, but I never removed it from my cart. So like a month later I bought, or I pre-ordered some stuff, some, uh, there were some black series figures and I just went through and checked out, not looking through it. Cause I was like, Oh, these are the only things I've added, whatever. So I just went through and checked out and then I got a shipping notification and I was like, Oh, what did I buy? So I had to go <laughs> in and like, look at it. And I was like, Oh, I guess I never took that out of my cart. 
So uh, <laughs> yeah, check your carts on Big Bad Toy Store. You're going to be accidentally getting stuff. But the uh, the Condor and the uh, I got one of the Swarm Troopers from a uh, buy sell trade group on Facebook, and people are selling them. You know, you can find some there, and I got some good deals because they were loose. Um, and I got the Swarm Trooper with the gear pack which is like the wings, the shield, and a couple extra guns. Um, and it's really good because it works with my DC multiverse because it looks just like a hive, like just a generic hive guy from, from DC. But yeah, like I, I, I actually do enjoy these. Like, don't, don't get me wrong. The first one, the first series had a lot more issues, um, and I just recently picked up the reissue of the Steel Brigade because I love the design of that figure. Um, it's one of my favorite figure designs on a six inch figure. I just, I lo- I really like it. I have nothing to say negative about the design. And then they did a night ops steel brigade. So it's the same body, same buck, same accessory, same everything, but a black, uh, olive and a little bit of like lime green hints as well. I just love the, the art or the coloring on that. And I bought the steel brigade, heavy weapons gear. So it had like a, like an AA 12 shotgun. It had a couple other weapons, a different head. So now I have four different steel brigades because I've got the gold head that came with the reissue. I've got the heavy weapons steel brigade that I put onto the blowback body. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, we should have pictures of all these up. So I put the blowback figure, put the heavy weapon steel brigade body onto it. Um, and that's, that's really is a positive about it. These figures are very interchangeable. They have a lot of pieces. They come with multiple hands, bunch of different guns, backpacks. Um, and then you can buy like the gear packs. Like I bought the Delta gear pack to go with the Delta trooper, um, which I'm going to use for a couple customizations with gridiron studios pro- uh, pieces as well. And, uh, it just, it expands a little bit on, on GI Joe. I, I can't say that they are the same as Hasbro because I think Hasbro is still leaps and bounds above them. The shoulders have a, a really weird gap on them. That's probably my biggest design choice that I don't like is the way the shoulders are. But I think if you were turned off by series one, but you've thought about picking them back up, definitely give the reissues a try. Uh, I think series three is supposed to be coming in soon. That's the full female wave with the female seal brigade and a couple other characters. But yeah, like I, I I pick them up sporadically, but I'm not uh I'm not whole hog into the line. I don't care for most of the most of the original characters, um, just if I can steal them and find a way to either customize them or make you know make them work. You mentioned DC Multiverse. Do you find that you use these figures more for that, or do you use them in the GI Joe universe as well, or are they their own thing? So all of these I use basically completely with the gi joe universe the only one that i don't is the swarm trooper he kind of bounces back and forth he's a little smaller than the dc multiverse figures but if you look at like the design of the logo and just the design of the character um if you've watched teen titans especially it looks exactly like the hive which is like an evil faction in it so it just looks like it fits with them really well if they're kind of not right next to each other because then they get overshadowed but even that probably is actually a little bit more with the G.I. Joe just because the scale works so well. I've only ever bought one Valiverse figure, and it was the Action Force Sergeant Slaughter. Okay. Which I was, you know, I had pre-ordered basically the day it was announced. I didn't open it because I think by the time I got it, we already knew, or shortly thereafter, we knew that the classified version was coming. Yeah. So I left this one sealed thinking, eh, you know, maybe I'll get to it when this, the other one comes out. And then the classified one came out, and I was so happy with it. I just thought, now nah, I'll just put this back. Maybe I'll get this arch to sign it someday. I mean, it's a good-looking figure. I just didn't feel like I needed two of them, and I do feel like the classified one, in terms of the design, captures the Sarge a little bit better. They had made a uh, set that was supposed to be like a gung-ho gear set to replace yeah. all of the stuff. That, and then they did that recolor on the retro wave. And that, so I was like, well, this is really all I need. I'll just get another one that's got the right colors. Cause that was my only major complaint. I'm not big on you know, like the, it comes with gun and gear fix that I do think are probably a better fit, but I don't really get tied down with that. The stuff. I think the character designs on these looks pretty good. But again, as I've already stated, if I can't directly slot it into the GI Joe universe, I typically it's typically a pass. I don't know anything about this actual independent universe at all. I think the character designs look fine. I just uh, I just don't buy stuff that's not directly GI Joe related. 
Um, it's all I've yeah. got room for. I really don't even have room for that. So <laughs> slot and other stuff is just not very feasible. Yeah, the only characters that I have uh, are Condor. Um, Blowback got turned into a Steel Brigade, and then uh, I have the Duster, and he he's kind of been kind of kit bashed, so he's not even really a unique character anymore. He's just kind of another faceless trooper. I put the helmet on him, and he's mostly covered up. But I think I think Condor will probably probably be the only one unless they release another figure that I just really like the design of. I like them mostly just because I like the. I like the steel brigade design and that's why I've converted most of their figures into a different steel brigade. I've got a couple of the night ops. They're a little closer to series one with a little bit, they're a little bit tighter. Um, so if you buy, you know, if anybody buys those, you, you'll probably, those are ones you're definitely going to want to be a little bit more careful with. Whereas with the, like the series, the special deployment series, I think is what it was called. Um, I didn't really have any issues with that. And then the weapons, I really like the designs of the weapons. Like they did a, a new gear pack that had the uh, Thompson uh, 19, whatever, 21 or M1A1 or whatever, the Tommy gun, um, just without the drum magazine. And I just love that gun. So I was like, oh, I'm going to buy that gear pack. And it came with another AA-12, a couple rifles, a sniper, a couple pistols and gear effects. So that kind of stuff I like because I like having options as opposed to, you know, when I troop build, if I have four of the same Cobra troopers, I would rather them have kind of a different loadout. You know, maybe one's a close quarters combat guy. One's got a sniper and having a little bit more realistic or actually very realistic guns. I like more than, um, the original release weapons, whereas classified is coming around on that. They're making a lot better headway in that. Okay. Anything else before we move on? No, that's it. Um, I would, I recommend maybe trying one figure out, seeing if you're okay with it. Um, especially like me, I bought one that I got it for like 20 bucks on online from somebody. So I can, I can definitely recommend it at that price point. Right on. So that's army surplus, uh, a segment that will come and go, you know, as we feel the need to talk about it, you know, instead of just trying to slot it into recent acquisitions, we'll have its own separate thing. And then, you know, we've got some pretty big Kickstarters in the pipeline. We'll, uh, we'll use it to talk about that as well. Specifically talking about, you know, we got a, I got a notification this week that the, um, Skeletron Robo Skull has been pushed back just a little bit. And they were talking about maybe shipping that stuff off individually as some parts arrived. And, uh, you know, Carson's art of G.I. Joe book is, you know, entering the, you know, the final phase, I think. Like they're final, starting to finalize some of the art on that. Uh, we'll be talking about that as well. I'm, I'm very excited to see that book and play with that Skeletron, that Robo Skull. So that's basically what the segment will be for. It won't be every single episode, just as needed. Uh, speaking of the segments that we need to get caught up on, let's go to let's go to our mailbox because we've got some letters. Don't make me come over there and snatch you up off that couch. It's time for mail call. Our first letter comes to us from David Matos. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced your last name, buddy. Uh, and it reads as follows: Greetings, Greg and Jaron. Glad to know y'all are indeed mortals and feeling that financial crunch too. I've often listened to the pod and wondered, how do these guys afford their collecting habit? We don't. We're all in debt. <laughs> For me, the bridge too far was that $300 HasLab his tank. I couldn't. I didn't. I don't feel bad about it. It was announced after I had just dropped $300 at G.I. Joe Fest. I'll wait for the economy version of a his tank in the classified line. Likewise, I had to pass on the Serpentor and Dr. Menbender figures. Good to hear that Target has plentiful Tiger Force Outbacks in stock. I am finally going to pick up mine after the fiasco of being constantly charged on my card for it and them finally canceling my order due to a technical issue and not being able to deliver it. Target had been doing better on the supply chain stuff. I'm not particularly stressed by the G.I. Joe classified line, less a gripe about the price point for Viper Troop Builder set. I don't care for a gold helmet officer myself. I'm sure classified will bunch up on me with figures I want to collect soon enough, however. What is stressing me out as a G.I. Joe collector is the Super 7 lines, both the Ultimates and Reactions figures. Luckily, I'm not a completionist, but the reaction figures are proliferating and are not cheap despite being five-point articulation classic Star Wars slash Funko style figures. They're as much as the O-rings Hasbro is putting out now. Makes you think of buying a six-inch classified figure instead. Still, hard to pass up some of their figures like CoverGirl, Shipwreck, or Zartan, but green shirts, blue shirts, Lady Cobras, Lady Joes, Snakelings, too much. Of course, I'll still try. 
Then on top of that, we have the Ultimates line, $55 action figures. I pulled the trigger on a pre-order for Wave 1 for $220, bucks, and I'm waiting for that charge to come on my card. Can I keep up with collecting an Ultimates line? I'm dubious. G.I. Joe with the Super 7 licenses seems like an oversubscribed property for a collector. Might I add, I'm not sure y'all have mentioned the Valiverse figures on the pod. Oh, that's well-timed, well which is another stressor <laughs> for the collector's budget. I finally bit on a Steel Brigade figure and pre-ordered the three new female figures. I'm surprised Hasbro hasn't come out with some weapon packs like Valiverse has done, but I'm sure it's in the pipeline. Pimp Daddy Destro definitely needed a gold AK-47. <laughs> that I'd finally drop y'all out of my two cents. Cheers, David in South Carolina. David, thanks so much for writing in. Lots of points here that we have talked about, uh, especially to, you know talking about how do people afford their collections. You know, it's it's just I think it's a struggle for most of us. Um, you got to kind of pick and choose your battles. Things like you know, you say you pass on Serpentor and Doctor Mindbender. That was stuff that Jaron and I both you know dialed down to just one of each. Or in, in Jaron's case, he got an extra one and had to go get rid of it because you just you know you can't justify it after a certain point. Um, talking about the uh, Super Seven line, you know. The reaction line, you know, is a perfect example. It's figures that I've been collecting kind of sporadically, and then they d drop something out of the blue that takes me by surprise. Like they've announced a new wave this week, and it has Raven in it. Raven is the female Strato Viper pilot from one single episode of the cartoon. It is a great deep cut that I absolutely want to have, and of course I feel. You know, I'm upset because it's not truly a compatible figure, but at the same time, I'm like, this is probably the only version we'll ever get. Maybe I'll get it and try to customize it, or, I don't know, still better than having nothing. And then to speak on the, you know, the Ultimates line, which has been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, I, you know, I did the same thing as you. I pulled the trigger on a pre-order for Wave 1. It was a whopping, you know, 200 plus dollars. And then every day I'm like, you know, man, this line's overdue. And then simultaneously, I don't have $220. So keep it going. Just keep, let's keep on rolling it down the line until I uh, am prepared for it. Luckily, that's one of the things I like about BBTS is that normally that give you a little bit of a heads up that it's coming. So I can start to kind of prep for it a little more. And then lastly, you know, to talk about the gun pack, which, you know, McFarlane Toys did something similar where they were... Having they couldn't put weapons with certain figures for licensing reasons, and so they said, "Well, we'll just put the weapons out by themselves, and you can do what you want to with them." I'm also surprised that's something that hasn't hit, but I would say that it's certainly not an impossibility that that's something we'll see down the line. I don't want to toot my own horn, but I did ask them that in one of the roundtables. That was the question that I asked: is if they had ever thought about something like that. What did they say? They, it was basically. We've considered all options, so I yeah. mean they're aware that there's a market for it, but um, I don't know how readily available they're ready to get into it. That's code for we're gonna let somebody else try it, and if it works for them, we'll copy it and steal yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a bunch. I mean, Valiverse and then Gridiron and um, Mark II Designs. Like, there's a bunch of people that are doing it. it. There's definitely a market for it. It's just if they see it as a profitable endeavor. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's it's truly still a premium price for the amount of plastic it takes to make the weapons, right? If you need, I don't yeah. know how much the packs that they put out cost, but or the, you know, their competitors, but what, 15, 20 bucks, probably using, you know, a fourth of the plastic to put a figure out. Yeah. All right, our next letter comes to us from Matthew Renko, uh, and he writes, Let me start out with saying hi, my name is Matt. I'm 36, and I've been a massive G.I. Joe fan since the early 90s. Probably about 1993. Talk about getting in at the end of the line. I love the show and toys all through my childhood and in my teens, the comics all the way through issue 300. All varieties, IDW, Marvel, Devil's Do, not necessarily in that order. They all hold high value for different reasons. I just found you guys very recently and I just wanted to reach out and give you my support. I'm a lonely nerd and it's just so much fun to hear other people gush about the whole universe. I find myself agreeing with you out loud and so much. I have so many comics from over the years and regularly reread them. I'm currently on Volume 4 from the Devil's Do Disavowed series. Some of my favorite art. Anyways, I love it. I'm glad you're doing this. Pretty much everyone else podcasting on this subject loses my interest. Thanks, guys. Keep on keeping on. Thanks, Matthew. That's ex extremely flattering. You know, people really underestimate what an impact writing in to a, you know, a low-volume show like this has. We read everything. We may not respond to it all, but this type of stuff is definitely fuel for the fire. And, it makes us feel really good. If you're, you know, it's interesting to talk to somebody that came into the G.I. Joe line as late as 1993, where most people would say they're, you know, probably on the 
decline by then. You know, certainly the stuff that was coming out is substantially different than what we started with. And although I love it all, you know, pretty, I have a pretty f flat love of everything. I find the value in it all. I think it's interesting to talk to people that, uh, started later on in the line and have worked their way backwards over time. It, you know, it's funny. We posted the, I posted the spy troops in the Velo versus Venom movie on our YouTube channel because I, I just couldn't really find it anywhere. And I thought, you know, I'm can post it in the highest quality that's available, you know, without compressing it. Cause I have the source and it's crazy how many people comment on it and are like, this is the thing that got me into GI Joe, or this is the thing. I remember watching this on Toonami, blah, blah, blah. And I'm always like, wow, that's really interesting to me that, I mean, every era is somebody's first era for GI Joe, but to see so many people come out of the woodwork and, and talk about, you know, this is Dr. Link Talbot, the veterinarian was my first GI Joe. I'm always very, I'm always very fascinated by that. And I'm, uh, interested you know kind of similarly when you know i let jaron loose into the universe it's always interesting to me to see where fans that started later on go from there like if you watch spy troops as your first G.I. joe movie ever what was the very next thing that you consumed and how did you feel about it um so yeah thanks for writing in matthew really it means a lot to hear from people like this and, you know, it says a lot that people write in and say, hey, you know, a lot of other people, I've kind of lost my interest, but you guys are doing something right. And I think it's just because we're, we really just like talking about it. I mean, and, you know, we try to not bring any negativity. We, there's things we don't like, but I'm really here to celebrate the wins of the line and not just pick apart all the stuff I don't like. Our next letter comes to us from uh, a previous writer, Patrick Davis. Patrick writes in, hello, Greg and Jaron. Hope all is well. I plan to be at Winterfest in a few weeks, driving up from North Carolina. I hope to meet you guys there. I have a few vehicles from my childhood and I'm looking to bring back to their former glory. Missing parts, missiles, stickers, etc. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how you approach. Well, let's tackle this on a point-by-point -point basis. A. Price point that forces the decision to go repro. Jaren, do you have any thoughts on what at what point when in a restoration or a missing part are you just like, I'm out? I don't even know. It d it depends, I guess I should say. It does depend on what the piece is. If it's something like the Moray lens, I'm not buying it at all. I'm buying a repro, absolutely, because it's going to be way too expensive, and it's not something that you can see and can tell. It'd be different if I was buying a repro, like, whole, like, body shell piece that you can obviously see something's different with. Um, you know, so there's kind of that give and take. If it's... If it's a bigger piece, a littler piece, if it's tucked away, if it's, you know, out there, but I'm definitely not paying $10 for a single piece unless it is a very big, important piece. $10 is an extremely uh, low bar to set. I, I know. I think that the the lens on the Moray is a perfect example. Uh, it's the first thing that's comes to my mind also as something that there's no way I would pay the full price for. It doesn't, you know, it's not, uh, if you don't even have it, it's really very, not very noticeable unless you're going right for it. My cutoff is, uh, I mean, I'm willing to pay quite a bit, quite frankly, for something that I'm missing. If it's something that can't be reproed or is a, is a premium defining characteristic. A good example is I got a hammer in that big lot when we bought that dude, when we bought all those vehicles from Louisville and I never owned a hammer yeah. before. It has an antenna that bends like a, like a arch. And I'm assuming because of that is a piece that is very hard to find and replace. Likewise, I've never seen a repro one of it and it is noticeable without it. Maybe because it's something that most people know breaks. I've looked at hammer antennas and I've bid quite a bit on hammer antennas and still lost. So I do try to bide my time and look for at least a good deal. If I'm overpaying for it, I want to, you know, I'm not in any immediate hurry to complete any one thing. Typically. I think another good example is the fantail railing from the flag. It's probably the, one of the, the most lost parts and has, I mean, it's, it's easily a $100 plus part that is not noticeable. It sits on the underside of the flag. It's like underneath the deck. You'd have to go and look for it. And so I bought, I mean, my flag, I've said before, my flag has got a lot of repro stuff on it as I try to bring it up to completion. And the Fantail railing is one of those things. And I, you know, I have no issues about that. When you're paying over a hundred dollars for a part that you can't see immediately, 
then, I mean, I don't know. I can just think about, I can do so much more with $100 than this one little thing. But I'm also a large scale collector that collects everything and is always in the process of trying to complete stuff from my childhood, stuff that I picked up in lots. I'm Everything I have seems like it's missing something. If I start to scrutinize the little things, I'll always have dozens and dozens of incomplete things. And because I want to be big picture about it, I'm just like, I got to get as much as I can with the dollars that I have. So, I mean, everybody's personal discretion, right? But I think there's a line where you go, ah, this is not worth it, ultimately. That's if you can even track one down in the first place. I'm of the mindset that the the older toys will are will eventually all be destroyed to a certain point. We'll reach it, maybe not in our lifetime, but there's going to be a point where there are no uh, fantail railings in existence. The plastic just, unless you like freeze dry it or something or like or put it in some kind of vault that's likely that they're going to deteriorate just from existing so why waste your money you know when there's nothing you can do to protect it in the first place next question best places to go slash find these parts and pieces shows online etc i will say you know full stop that i've had more like finding incomplete parts for vehicles at shows than anything else um, you know, my big advice is always, if you're looking to buy, if you're going to a convention and especially if you got a bigger mid to larger vehicle in mind, then go to a convention and shoot for it there because the price of shipping alone can put you a third of the way to paying for the item altogether. You know, I've also spoken positively about lost and found toys run by our friend, Greg number two, who has specific bins of parts and it's just like you open it up and it's just a bunch of parts for a specific vehicle. You root out what you have, you know, and then you bring them to him and he'll get you the price. And I can't even, I couldn't begin to tell you how much stuff that thanks to Greg, I've been able to near completion is if you sit down and do your homework and make a list of specifically what you're looking for, even in an instance where you don't know the exact name, which I often don't just re- describe it well enough that you'll remember what it is when you're looking at like whale missile holder rack or something like that. And then you go to a show like this, you can find tons of stuff at a great deal. I mean, I really have found tons of stuff at a great deal. Thanks to that. I, you know, similarly, our other go-to vendor is Destro's Toy Den, who sets up at a lot of conventions like these. He'll just have bins of vehicles that he's broken apart for whatever reason. They, you know, there might have been a missing piece or incomplete or whatever. And that stuff is dirt cheap. Now, it's a lot of work. So you either need to set a lot of side of time at the convention to sit on the floor and dig through a plastic bin in the hopes that you find something that you're looking for. But I, you know, mostly I have great luck with that. I he was selling the entire fixture for the wheels of the Defiant in one of those bins, pieces that you know the tabs that connect to those takes have taken stress over the years. I'm not going to get into a long-winded story, but essentially, if you're not familiar, the Defiant was not designed to support its own weight, and so over the years, the weight of the Defiant has started to break the tabs that hold those wheels off of their own accord, and. I, maybe they're not as rare as I thought, but I have at least one broken one that I had glued back together, and I found those in the bin. And to me, that was very a very valuable find, and I'm sure there's other stuff like that. I bought a thing out of that bin and then had a guy that was looking for that specific part came to me and bought the part from me because he needed it. I didn't. I was just going to use it for like decoration or diorama. So you never know what you're going to find in that stuff. If you got enough time, you got enough diligence, do your homework, you will find great deals on parts, especially if you're looking for a bunch of stuff. If you go in and you're just like, I need three things. I need a Moray lens. I need a Fantail railing. I need a hammer antenna. You're not going to have a lot of luck. The only other option you have is if you're not going to a show is to go on eBay or like uh, Mercari or whatever the other kind of auction sites are and just set up an alert for what you're looking for. You know, make a description like G.I. Joe, comma, hammer, comma, antenna. And every time one pops up, look for it. Maybe somebody's listed it with a low bite now. Uh, maybe somebody has described it improperly and you can get a good deal on it because people are not finding it in their search history. Other than that, it's really just a waiting game, depending on how patient you are 
and how, and how cheap you are. If you if you fish for it long enough, you'll eventually get a bite. It's just a it's just a waiting game. I'll get a hammer antenna eventually. Uh, I'm just I'm willing to wait as long as it takes to find it at the right price. And lastly, the expectations on how difficult this will be to do finding stuff for one type of vehicle versus another that factors into what we were just talking about. The difficulty will vary depending on how impatient you are. I mean, if you're one part away from completing something complicated like a whale or even the you know the original GI Joe headquarters, which is something that I completed last year. And it's not a super expensive piece. I don't sweat it too much. Jaren's got a much shorter cutoff than I do. If I get out, if I'm like one piece away and it's, let's say, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks. And it's the last thing I need. I'll probably go ahead and get it. Maybe not right away, but I'll put like a 30 day window where I'm like shop for it for a little bit. If it doesn't show up in 30 days, just get it. And you can mark it off the list because that's what I'm doing right now. I'm all about completing stuff that, you know, that has been incomplete since I was a child. So I don't care if I pull, it, you know, I've overpaid for tons of stuff, sometimes because of situations just like this, but it doesn't bother me. I don't look back and regret it. Instead, I look back and go, yep, one more vehicle checked off. No price too small, buddy. So <laughs> you have any, any other things to add into that? No, I mean, I think it's important for me to say that I'm also a very different collector than probably the market that you're really asking for. I have no connection to these things other than that. I think they're cool now. So I'm not going into it with any, Oh, I had this as a kid. Oh, I had for a lot of these vehicles, the first shows were the first time I seen them, you know, they're other than maybe a picture on the internet, maybe. So, um, that's why I am not, I'm not willing to spend like crazy. And, I think we've touched on it quite a few times. I'm also rough on it. I let my kids play with it. So like the way I look at it is those really hard to find easily broken things. It's probably better if I don't have them because if I break it, I feel bad, you know, cause like then someone who's been searching for it would not be able to get it. Cause I broke one. So, um, I think it's important to preface, or I guess I should have prefaced it with that because, um, I mean, I've taken my whale into a Creek, and it's a, it's a complete whale. You know, my moray has been in a Creek, you know, it's not a complete moray cause I don't have the winds and I will never have the winds. It's, it's just the, the unique position I'm in where I'm coming into this starting in 2021, you know, like a little bit different. As always, appreciate your help and look forward to meeting you at Winterfest. Thanks, Patrick Davis. Patrick, thanks so much for writing in great questions. Uh, really love it when people have stuff to write in, you know, stuff to, to spur conversation like that. And, and we, you know, we look forward to talking to you at Winterfest as well. And rest assured, we'll be here. Uh, we'll probably be digging through a plastic bin looking at spare parts. <laughs> I need to sit down and do some, I got to do some homework uh, probably this week or next and start making a list of things I'm looking for. If I don't have a list, I cannot go in blind anymore. I just don't remember what I'm missing and what I don't. I look at stuff so much that I sometimes forget if I actually have it on my own personal vehicle, the way that I've been doing it actually is I've tried to pick about four or five things that are important to me. And those are the things that I, I go through, you know, Yojo or 3d Joe's and I look at the, where they break down everything that comes with it. And I start very slowly, you know, marking off every little thing. And then if I find something that's missing, which happens often, I've bought vehicles that I was told was complete and they are turned out to not be complete. Cause I just didn't know what would, what could be missing, what I was looking at. Essentially, I make a little list. And then when I hit the con, you know, I start, I find we typically have the time because we hang around for quite a while. I just start digging through it and see what I can find. Our last letter comes to us from Christopher Huff, who we talked to in a previous episode. He writes, Yo, Joe, loving the podcast, guys. Keep it up. Just a few FYIs. If you want a Hiss tank that's more like the Night Attack version, check out the Hiss version too. It includes all sorts of improvements, including a two-person cockpit that opens underneath, a three-barrel gun missile mount on the side, and even a troop carrier compartment in the rear. It's my favorite version of the Hiss. You know, I didn't have a Hiss 2 until maybe like, maybe two years ago, and now I have two of them, and I, I also love it a lot. It's a bigger version of the Hiss. It has a lot of improvements. I think the color would have been cool if they'd stuck with the original black, but it was featured in the... Uh, it was featured in the Real American Hero comic in like the 80s, I think. It's a, it was a part of the story where um, 
Mutt and Spirit are in Millville and it's getting taken over by Cobra and uh, his two is prominently featured as one of the tanks that patrols the street. And I remember thinking as a young man then, whoa, this thing looks great. I really want it. And for whatever reason, couldn't find it, couldn't afford it. One, you know, in our third reason here. So when I finally got one, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it took me this long to get one. I love it. And I got another one in a lot later on. And normally I don't keep two of much because of a, I don't have a lot of room. And I, but I made an exception for this. I was like, yes, I can have another his two because you're right. It does look exceptional. But yeah, good point. If you know, the his two also does some stuff that makes it seem a little bit more like the his that we would see in 16. Uh, it's a little bit roomier. Uh, it's a little bit more functionally like that his. As for the his speed, remember it stands for high speed sentry. To be honest, it's really a poorly designed vehicle if you think about a real world practicality. Apparently, more say that it's an armored patrol car than a main battle tank. Also, I don't know if you noticed this, but just like with the Wolverine appearance and the importance of motion lines and when the bear has it and when the hiss has it exploding, there is a motion line for Baroness's glasses. He's talking about when the hiss explodes and she's trapped in it. And then there's an emotion line for something else that's thrown out of frame by the explosion. We all know what that was, but I wouldn't say it just because it might spoil it for someone reading this. This world's gotten too worried about spoilers that we're leaving, that we're censoring ourselves. Has this world gotten too worried about spoilers that we're censoring ourselves on the emails? We're not. And Chris, I got to be honest with you. I don't know what you're talking about. So I'm going to look it up right now. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a motion line there. It does show something. A little I can't, farther. I guess it should be her body, right? Or just maybe just part of her body. Maybe her head. No, she's fine. <laughs> I mean, we know she's fine, but they might not have known it when they drew it. <laughs> someone, someone dies. Remember? Yeah. The guy that got harpooned. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. He got he definitely did not make it. You don't walk that off. That's gotta be what it is. He says there's emotion line for something else that's thrown out of the frame by the explosion. You know, talking with the assumption that yeah, there's some gonna be some spoilers for this, you know, thirty year old comic or whatever. But yeah, I'm assuming that's the Baroness's body that gets thrown as well, which will you know, it's only a couple issues away till we figure that out anyway. That's a good point. I guess actually something I skimmed over because I was just focused on the glasses themselves. And I guess hence a little bit about, you know, Larry talks a lot about writing book to book, page to page, but I think he does have a little bit of insight of what, you know, they're not just flat out killing off characters that they just released an action figure for. I think he probably <laughs> intended all along that he was going to, she was going to be fine and he was going to bring her back. Chris, thanks for writing in, buddy. It's always nice to hear from you. Uh, it's nice that we have regular writers now also. Uh, if you'd like to write into us, uh, you can do that at one of our two email addresses. You can write us at anythingjoespod at gmail.com or anythingjoespodcast at gmail.com. We regularly read and respond to both. Um, you know, it's uh, you can always leave us a comment on our YouTube channel as well, which we also pretty much daily, it seems like. And heck, if you really want to go above and beyond, you can leave us a review on our podcast services because I'm told that really brings new eyes to the material. I don't know how true that is, but... Uh, no harm in trying, right? We'll be back in two short weeks with, uh, looks like we got another, con oh no, sorry, in two short weeks, we'll be talking about Winterfest. <laughs> Winterfest 3 is just around the corner now for us, and I don't know about you, Jaren, but I am extremely excited about it. Yeah, I'm super pumped. I am, this is going to be a little bit different of a show. Normally I get a big list, I'm trying to, you know, pick what kind of crazy things I want to buy. This one's going to be a lot more chill. I'm going to try to be more of a, a Jason from order of battle, you know, just walk around and talk and chat and, you know, maybe not buy. I mean, I still won't buy as much as it's Jason, but maybe talk <laughs> as much would be the goal. I don't know if anybody can talk as much as Jason. You got to work true. on that. Maybe talk on, half as much. <laughs> you got to work on that, <laughs> that smooth ASMR voice. Maybe <laughs> no, I Let's got stop I looked, here. I, I took a, <laughs> <laughs> I took a look at the vendors list today and, you know, Winterfest is the smaller show for, you know, the Louisville area, but it looks like the, because they're in a new location, there are more vendors there than ever before. And certainly the people that we shop with the most regularly are going to be there. And that's not factoring in all the, you know, obviously I'm excited to talk to Jason and Joel. It's one of the only times all year we get to see them face to face and hang out. Um, the guys from podcast from the pit are going to be there. And then, you know, we've got listeners like Patrick that are coming to hang out with us. And as a dude, that's not 
very socially active, it's the one time where I'm really just like, yes, this is a, I'm around my people and I'm excited to interact and talk with them. And if you can, if you can get there for the Friday night preview, I feel like for buying stuff, it is absolutely worth it. Yeah, I would say that if you're looking for something specific, if you are, you know, if you're coming with a large budget, the the preview night is 100% worth it. We learned that the hard way by skipping out on it a couple of years, but I don't think we'll ever miss it again because it's there really is a bit of a first dibs vibe to it where you see some great deals that just simply will not last until the next morning. I, you know, we saw vendors buying from them last time. There, Some of that stuff is so, uh, I don't say mispriced, but price to sell is definitely the way I would describe it. So we'll be covering that in our next episode. I'm very excited. My budget's not exactly where I want it to be, but I'm still working on it. Rest assured that even if I go in with a minimal amount of money, I'm going to stretch it to the max. Either that or I'll do something stupid, like I'll go in and buy a Night Force Boomer, and then I'll just (laughs) stare at it for the next 48 hours until we come home and record and talk about it. (laughs) Our goal, and I know that Jason and Joel have the same goal, is trying to record something with someone while we're there. I'm not even going to pretend like if that happens, it'll be the most irregular thing that's ever happened at the show is that we actually record something while we're there (laughs) instead of just goofing off. (laughs) But we'll find out in two short weeks when we, when our next episode's available and we look forward to talking to you then where anything's available for discussion here on anything Joe's.